I wanted to share a tool that I started using recently. And if you're doing any prospecting or lead sourcing from LinkedIn, it's definitely worth checking out. The tool is called Surf and it's spelled S-U-R-F-E. It's a Chrome extension that allows you to add contacts to your CRM directly from LinkedIn. I use it to add contacts quickly, follow my deals, keep track of my notes. And it's actually saved me a bunch of time. The data is always 100% accurate because I don't have to copy and paste each detail from each contact over to my CRM. Instead, Surf does it all for me automatically with just one click. Now, the folks over at Surf have been kind enough to put together a promo offer for fans of SSP. You can go to the link in the show notes and use the promo code JWSURF with an E5 for a 5% discount on your first year. Check out the link in the show notes and go check them out. This one is for the savvy startups and SMBs out there. I've got a secret weapon for you that's going to skyrocket your sales without the unnecessary headaches that come along with using one of the big player CRM systems. That secret weapon is Close CRM. Now let's face it, we've all been there. We've used a clunky, confusing system that kind of makes you want to throw your laptop out the window. Well, fear not, Close is here to save your time, money, and sanity. Close has all of the powerful sales tools you need, minus the drama, to manage your leads, track your deals, and crush your targets effortlessly. It has calling, emailing, SMS, multi-channel sequences, and it even has meeting tracking built right in. It's easy to set up and implement. You can stop screwing around with CRMs that aren't built for you and start selling and managing customers today. You can start a free trial using the link in the show notes, special for SSP fans. Today, I'm speaking with Jamie Shanks. Jamie is the CEO of Pipeline Signals out of Toronto. And the conversation today is geared around how you can increase your self source pipeline, how you can better focus on the right account targets, and how you can use intelligence to uncover the window of change. And he goes more into detail on this, but it's basically this 30 to 100 day period when your buyers are on the move, they're changing jobs, and they're more receptive to implementing your solution during that time period. So if you've got a compelling message and case to reach out, you're a lot more likely to be able to engage that buyer in a deal cycle. And with that, here's Jamie. Rock and roll. All right. Jamie, welcome to the SaaS Sales Players. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, very excited to dig into to some of the stuff that you teach, some of the businesses that you've started and it looks like sold also. So maybe a great place to start would be just tell us a bit about how you got into this crazy business of tech sales. I um, I kind of fell into it. I didn't want to be a seller. I wanted to be a stockbroker. Nice. And um, unfortunately, I discovered that being a stockbroker is a seller. So long of the short, I live in Toronto, Canada. I worked on the stock exchange. Then I was in commercial real estate. And then I got recruited by one of my customers to help with a company called Firmex that uh, started in the digital data room space and uh, built it up from $0 to 3 million ARR, which helped it become profitable. And at that point, I was, say, 31 years old. I thought I knew everything there was to know about sales. So I decided right. to quit my job and start a consulting company. And that consulting company, its aspirations were no bigger than helping local Toronto businesses with inside sales best practices. Two years in, it was failing, didn't know what I was doing, had very few customers. And at that same time, I saw around a corner. And around that corner was the advent of LinkedIn. And that mm -hmm. sales professionals, account executives like myself, had no idea how to use it, no idea how to use it for business development. So I took a moment to self-teach myself and reverse engineer the tool like it was a cold calling tool. Yeah. Sure enough, it worked. Built the world's first curriculum on the topic of social selling, coined the word social selling, and then scaled a company called SalesFlex. So that's how I started helping the tech community was through social selling. Let's go back really quickly to the the experience you had at Firmax. It sounds like there was some you know massive growth. And and were you in a selling position there, or were you in a leadership position? Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. So think of it as player coach, employee three or four. And um, this was the advent of a topic called um, Sales 2.0, which essentially kind of coincides with uh, Salesforce and the book by Aaron Ross, uh, Predictable yeah. Revenue. Good one. Which was the idea 
that if you look at the timeline of a sales process and you break it down into stages, an account executive who is a full cycle seller was doing too much heavy lifting. And if you could separate it into $5 an hour tasks and $500 value of value creators, right. you would start to see this natural place for what would be the future of the SDR BDR role. So we were using technology such as Leadlander to track people that were on our website and then call them the second they were there. I mean, this was blazingly innovative. Yeah. And so we were booking dozens and dozens of demos a week with an outbound cold calling motion. So that was the Firmex days. Yeah. And, and this is this is even before social selling. It was just called Sales yeah. 2.0. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. A lot of people don't know the the Aaron Ross era uh, or, or origin, right? Of kind of the SDR model and how that broke out and, and splitting out the, the, everyone just accepts it today as it is. It's just, you know, how most people have done things their entire career. But if you go it back, I guess- more sense then because there was a huge yeah. price discrepancy or labor arbitrage between the SDR and the AE. That has shrunk and the role of the SDR BDR has become much more in question because of this. Yeah. So that's something I've talked about recently on the show, which is sort of what what is the future of of the business development rep or the SD, you know, sales development rep, especially now with the technologies that are coming out, as many tools as there is. What's what's sort of your take on that? It, it sounds like you know you you were definitely a believer back in the Aaron Ross days, which is what early two thousands is kind of when that was pioneered, right? Um, but here we are in 2023. What's what's your thoughts on kind of the future of that career path? Well, okay, so I'm going to get a little nerdy, but I always look at it from the perspective of the chief financial officer or the CEO. So back 15 years ago, when an yeah. SDR was being paid 35000 and an AE was being paid seventy five to 100000 you have a three times labor arbitrage that made sense for that SDR to run all those inbound leads at that time being called as the customer, somebody picking up the phone. Hey, I noticed you're on our website. And like there, it, it was so innovative at that time and the SDR role flourished. Okay. Yeah. So now let's fast forward to today. What has happened is the vast majority of marketing of, of demand generation and marketing tools People process has all been poured into that marketing slash demand gen side. So I want you to picture something. It's a graph that looks like what's called total utility and marginal utility. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain it kind of through ice cream. So every time you take a lick of an ice cream, you're increasing the total utility. So every time you buy a tool in marketing and demand gen, you're increasing the spend and every time you add people, you're right, SDRs and BDRs, you're increasing total utility. As you lick an ice cream, the first lick is a 10 out of 10. It tastes amazing. The second lick is a 9 out of 10, and then a 7, and then a 6. And a marginal utility curve starts to bend to the point where ice cream scoop like 700 and you're sick, right? Yeah, so yeah you don't want any more ice cream. Yeah, what's <laughs> happening, I believe in marketing and demand gen is we have so over indexed the spend on people process technology. But unfortunately, what has happened is the marketing slash demand generation function is still only making up for, maybe it provides 10% of the total lead flow necessary for sales quota attainment at the AE level, 25%. So what's happened is these AEs who live on an island, they work from home, they are provided a laptop and a cell phone and a Zoom info list. They themselves have to self-source more than 50% of their sales quota themselves. Right. And if they're lucky, the other 50% is a tailwind that comes from marketing or the channel. So there's this massive disparity of money and resources who only have generated 25% up to 50% of the lead flow. The other 50%, you're relying on these disparate armies of people to go fill the rest. That mathematical equation, I believe, is come to roost. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is. Uh, that's why you see 
cost of customer acquisitions are off the charts. Payback periods are measured in years, not months. None of this makes sense anymore. Right. I believe that the AE function is going to, A, have more pressure put on them, more full cycle. The AE has, if you look at the three metrics that matter in sales, you have vol in prospecting, you have volumes, velocity, and probability, or known as conversion. The seniored AE is able to not have as many volume-based conversations, but their converse, their conversations convert better. Right. I believe overall there's going to be more emphasis placed on AEs mm -hmm. getting back to being full cycle. Right. What's your own deals? Yes, marketing will provide you a, a small amount of lead flow to make to help with quota attainment, but you'll be making up the vast majority. And I believe that technology is going to take a dent out of that SDR role mm -hmm. and some of that outbound BDR role. So I believe that if I were if I were a young seller today, I would A, always master the art of prospecting. It will serve you the rest of your life. Right. But be cognizant of the fact that um, your role will be more in question than it's ever been in history. Wow. That that actually aligns, I think, almost exactly with my thoughts. And, you know, I've been in this space for about 10 years, so not not quite as long as you have. Um, but that's that's where I can see it going also, is the earlier couple of years of my career were more focused on, I was full sales cycle. But then I saw this big rise in, hey, I don't have to think as much about my pipeline because we've got an SDR team. And there's plenty of, yeah. yeah. It'd be great if it's 75% of your pipe was being filled by them, but it wasn't probably. Right, right. And I, I love the, first of all, you've jolted me back to my college microeconomic days, uh, my, my, my college microeconomics classes. And I love the the ice cream analogy and just kind of where things are. So that th those are some some very interesting thoughts. So how can, you know, maybe, maybe from here, I, I really want to know for my AE listeners out there, because you're saying- there's going to be a little bit more work involved being an AE because you are going to be responsible for filling your pipe, closing your deals, converting, you know, converting your deals, closing your deals. How can, how can an AE start to prepare their mindset and, you know, prepare their, their book of business for this transition, which I think like you're saying, will probably play out here pretty quickly over the next, you know, couple of years. What you said in your question, I think is exactly where I was going to start. And one of the most yeah. important pieces. The first is the mindset. That AE, listen, you may have been a graduated BDR, right? You were the most successful BDR in your class. A couple of years in, they promoted you to AE. You started with small accounts. Now you're working majors in global enterprise. Whatever it might be, you thought, like when we all graduated university, we all kind of washed our hands and were like, we don't have to learn anymore. This is amazing. Then you become a 30-year-old and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> is a and you have yeah. to in my 30s i had to reintroduce myself back to learning the reason i bring this up is no matter how much you want to escape day-to-day -day prospecting you even as an entrepreneur there are days i own three companies and there are days i'm like oh my god is this really <laughs> i've got to do this yeah. again in year 13 yes right the the first principles are that you are going to have to get back into a mindset that the only person that's going to control your destiny is you. Step two, yeah. I would build a quota attainment waterfall. What that means, and we have a free resource at Pipeline Signals you can download, but essentially you put in how much, what is your quota? Let's say it's a million dollars. It will start calculating in reverse down from a goal which you can't control, you can only align to, right. you have to have it wind downwards towards a control factor. These are actions and activities and daily things that you need to do every day that highly influence the milestones and the objectives you want to hit on a quarterly basis to align to the ultimate big goal for the year. If you don't do some of these fundamentals every day, every week, there's no probability you're going to hit that. Right. And so... That's step two. Step two is you have to know what are the actions and activities you must do. And what it does, this calculator does, is it helps you uh, predict what percentage of your lead flow is going to come as a tailwind. It's going to come in from the inbound team. It's going to come in from your channel partners. 
But then what is the rest that you have to, what's called self-source or self-generate? For a lot of you, there's that's the big miscalculation. You all just assume, oh, marketing's got my back. No, probably marketing has to provide, or sorry, probably you have to make up yeah. 50 to 75% of your pipeline yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Step three is you are going to actually have to build a plan to prospect. Now, of course, there's being re-enabled on how mm -hmm. to if you haven't done it in a while. Yeah. But from a tactical standpoint, one of the things that you can do is focus uh, almost exclusively at first on account selection and account prioritization. It is the single death to all prospectors. They spend too much time on the wrong accounts. Mm -hmm. Use objective data and sales intelligence to tell you why should I go after a company A versus company B? Should I do it today, not tomorrow? If you focus in on account selection based on objective reasons, such as compelling events that are happening in their business, you have a higher probability of open doors. So right. those are kind of the three steps I'd take. So talk to us a little bit about pipeline signals. Do you, it looks like that intelligence piece is part of the product. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. How does so, that work? Um, running sales for life for 10 years, we enabled 600 global customers, a quarter million plus sellers. What we mm -hmm. saw is we were teaching sellers a sales play called the sphere of influence, which means you take a happy customer. I'm drinking out of a Yeti water bottle here. So am I. <laughs> yeah. So Yeti is your happy customer and you sell to product officers, chief product officers. Inevitably, on an average of about every two years, the people in the product team will up and leave their job and go other places. And they go mm -hmm. to Igloo Cooler, so to speak. When they get to Igloo Cooler, they're going to bring in the people, process, and technology that made them successful in the past. It's called following your fans or uh, you know, customers on the move. Yeah. You're, what you want to do is track this change. And so basically, it's human capital migration. And watching everyone that gets hired, promoted, or leave any account what we first do is teach AEs or AMs, account managers, how do you look for a signal? What is a signal? How do you mine it yourself? But then as a tailwind, we provide you a, every single job change in the world that matters to you. And so that you can call them before your competition. Uh, but the order of operations is learn it. When you learn it, you appreciate it and you can do it yourself. Then we come in as a tailwind and we provide all the account managers, all account executives, every job change in every account of theirs so they can reach them during what's called the window of change. That first yeah. 30 to 100 days when the executives mm -hmm. knew. So I love that. I love that tactic uh, because I've deployed it myself, right? I'll go into my prospecting accounts. And I know right now LinkedIn has, uh, I think, a report or in Sales Navigator, you can pull who's changed in the last 90 days. I'm curious what, if any additional information, you know, your, your product adds to that process. But I know it works really well. You tend to get someone, if they're 30 days in a role, 60 days in a role, especially if it's a director and above, they've typically got some ideas for what they need to get done in those first, let's call it hundred days in the new job in order to, you know, kind of stay on. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah. Is there anything else that your that pipeline signals does that kind of helps with that process of engaging that person or does it just feed into, you know, does it just take LinkedIn data and say, Hey, so-and-so changed jobs. They're now at this company and they're 30 days in. Yeah. So if you look at it as an AE, you can create a, a lead list. I want to follow all the cooler companies, right? I want to follow Yeti yeah. and Igloo and Coleman's and so forth. You're only seeing when somebody net new takes a job or somebody right. gets promoted. What you're missing is the context of who they are and where they came from. Mm -hmm. What our solution does is behind the scenes, we have the list of all of your customers globally. And so it's cross-pollinating customers on the move. Somebody leaves your customer in Seattle in the auto industry right. and moves into Igloo Cooler. Where did they come from? How long ago they were a customer? What, what, what projects they worked on? When did they move there? So we create the context for the AE. You're not just calling that there was a job change. You're right. calling a customer on the move that came from this customer. And now you can identify 
the story you can tell based on their success from their company. So as part of onboarding, we actually work behind the scenes with sales leadership. We have a global command center of all mm -hmm. the customers and all the accounts you want to monitor. And we're doing the cross correlating for the AE. So the AE sees the job change, but they also have the context why. So that's a good that's a good call out and distinction because with something like Sales Navigator, yes, I can go in and sa proactively save my account list, my leads. Yeah. What does tend to happen now, and I've seen this in my own, you know, prospecting and, and book of business is, you know, of course, I'm going to pick the top five, call it sexiest brands on my account list. And I'm going to go find the relevant executive buyers uh, or sponsors for the deals that I'm doing, right? But you're saying there's an opportunity to be sort of fed the data that I'm not looking at, which is maybe not those top five brands in my book. It's who else is out there that's also assigned in my, you know, my account list, but I'm not, they're not on my radar right now. And Correct. then besides just reaching out and saying, Hey, Jamie, congrats on the new job. Wondering if now is a good time to look at XYZ tool. It's Jamie came from a relevant company, a competitor, a relevant space, or maybe even a non-relevant space. Um, I found that really interesting. I had McDonald's in my book for a long time, and it was just so bizarre to see execs go from different industries into McDonald's. And for whatever reason, McDonald's saw some value in bringing, for example, like an automotive executive in, or you know, someone who came from tech to McDonald's, and you know, maybe having some context into why did they make that hire, <laughs> and how is that a valuable insight as a seller? You know, what does that mean for selling my SaaS? into McDonald's, right? What is that? What's the bigger picture here? So I love the concept and I wholeheartedly agree with the the approach to, to prospecting, especially again at those leadership levels because they've typically got some directives or many directives in their first hundred days that they need to accomplish and they're ripe for change, right? Yeah, well, and, and just to add some more context to it. So uh, if you're an AE, you're typically broken up into three different pods. Pod number one, you could be verticalized. So call everyone in the quick serve restaurant. You were talking about McDonald's. Call everyone yeah. in the quick serve restaurant industry. Pod two, geography. Call everyone in the state of Illinois, McDonald's founding state. Yeah. Number three is a set of named accounts. In the first two instances, when you're a geo-based or a verticalized based AE, now, all of a sudden, we can find signals, not just against the accounts that are in your CRM that you know. We do two things. One, we fill in the rest of the buying committee. So mm -hmm. you're not single threaded. You actually will, yeah. will populate all the product officers, UX designers, whatever your buyer persona is. But we'll find greenfield accounts. So yes, McDonald's was on your list. But did you consider calling, I don't know, like Jamba Juice? Or yeah. did you consider five guys? They weren't on your list, but they meet your ideal customer profile. They are in the quick serve restaurant. And now a past customer is the head of five guys, you know, product. And that is a big value add for the sellers that are also beyond the named account list. It's like, what else is out there? Wow. No, that's that sounds incredible. And uh, I'm definitely sold here. And again, you know, I think that's a great approach and, and it's, it's crazy that you can get that much data and then sort of put it together in a way that, that makes it really actionable for the seller. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what the last kind of mile to this is the sales team, the seller gets to choose where they want to access this intelligence. Most of our customers place it in the CRM as a contact and an account, a task, like it'll assign a to do. Uh, you can go in as leads. You can push that over to a sales engagement platform if you're interested. You can go into Sales Loft, Outreach, Rev.io, Groove, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, or some just work it off a CSV file. Work wow. it off a CSV file. We'll send it to them via Microsoft Teams or Slack and say, hey, it, it, you just need this data. Get going. And that's the big challenge is I see too many companies fret and spin their wheels like, oh, we got to talk to RevOps and we've got to, um, you know, make sure this looks all perfect in the CRM. And like every other big company, that takes months. It's an act of Congress yep. to get anything changed in the CRM. <laughs> but what yeah. happened last month? Your AE didn't hit quota. Your AE didn't book enough net new meetings. And every month, 
you complain and cry about, oh, the CRM, you could have just had this email to them and they could have yeah. called these same prospects because these signals are like milk in the sun. They spoil, right? <laughs> and if you're not calling them as they're, as they're changing jobs, somebody else is. So. Right. Right. I want to hear, do you have any customer success stories you can share with just clients you've worked with that really turned things around? Maybe they went from like the just smile and dial random phone numbers or random contacts in a CRM to having a very intelligent approach to to their prospecting and really leveling up their team and their, their reps. As a collective, the average customer increases their pipeline coverage. So the number of opportunities in their total pipeline coverage by 20% within wow. six to 12 months. Why? Because two front one, as part of our certification experience, the final certification to one of the four programs that we have is the seller needs to pick an account, plan it, engage it and create a real life sales opportunity. So on mm -hmm. our website now you'll see two programs. Every seller goes through social selling mastery. They go through the spear program, which is an account based sales development program. And we're launching two other certifications. So within Spear, just as part of that, every seller will have to make a video case study defending the opportunity they created. So it's forced pipeline creation. Oh, interesting. It's the AE self-sourcing and proving in a video uh, in a video how they did it. And so what happens is they keep repeating this process as part of an accountability dance, so to speak, but then we're giving them the tailwind of signals. So that's how the pipeline is created. It's it's not magical in the sense that like we have invented the greatest widget of all time mm -hmm. for, for prospecting. We have a sales play that every seller knows inherently works, but we drive accountability to them actually doing something with it. And that's why it works. I love the pipeline defense exercise because, yeah. uh, you know, in a lot of cases, the, the best sales managers that I've worked for implement an exercise like that. But for every great manager I've had that did do that, I've had a handful that didn't. So it's pretty cool to hear that that's part of your service is not only do you need to go follow the steps, get the intel and do the outreach, but once you have a two-way conversation going with a prospect, you've got to prove that it's a, you know, in profile, qualified, Time frame, all of the, you know, whatever framework, I'm sure, I'm sure you work with different frameworks, but you know, whether it's Bant or whatever it is, you've got yeah, to use prove... medic or med pick or yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's super cool. Um, so all in all, like how, how many weeks does it take to, to kind of go through your, uh, you know, process as a customer? Is this like a six week thing? Is this a year long project? Well, it's a, so it's a monthly subscription. Mm -hmm. um, you can cancel anytime. So we have made it hard on ourselves, uh, but <laughs> good for the customer to which we're providing value every month. And that monthly dance is every month there's learning, there's training programs, and we provide signal reports. Every quarter, every, the group of sellers go through a certification experience. So there's a new course every quarter and it's month to month. And so it's forced us to learn what customers want because we're flying very close to the sun for net yeah. promoter score. It's like every month we've got to prove our value. Wow. That's insane. That, yeah, that's, that sounds like a lot of hustle to kind of keep the, it the has emotions. Been, <laughs> but it, you know, we have not been, we haven't been around for two years, pipeline signals. Um, we kind of launched it in the fall of 2021, really kind of, we raised a uh, small round of capital. January of 2022 is where like it kind of took off with customers. Yeah. We're forcing ourselves to iterate and learn very quickly because it's a month recurring revenue model. All right. I've got an interesting question. And the reason I'm asking this, I'm going to call this out is be someone out there listening right now is probably at a company on a team that's taking the wrong approach to all this. So the question is, what are some things that you see teams, companies, reps doing just completely wrong? They were, they're just completely missing the mark on their outbounding, on their pipeline generation, on their coverage. Uh, we've talked about a few, but I want to hear some other examples and hopefully for the listeners, this helps them really put a picture, you know, paint a picture in their own mind of something's got to change and we need to start looking for resources like pipeline signals to help us close this gap. Yeah. So uh, I've already touched on the first, the, the first yeah. is if 
you could have the greatest product with the story of a lifetime. But if you're aiming that story at the wrong accounts, and what I mean wrong, they could actually look exactly like your ideal customer profile. But there's no compelling reason for that company to change. You have to understand that I'm holding my Yeti again. Yeti, yeah. the company, doesn't get out of bed every day and doesn't think, oh, I need to change. Yeah. Yeti is a corporation. It's the people that work within those businesses that bring in priorities or taketh priorities away when they leave. If you are not finding, and there's all kinds of other types of signals, right? There's IPO readiness, M&A readiness, uh, whatever it might be. But humans who go into a business, they want to make a change. People that get promoted, they want to make a change. People that leave take a priority with them. It's a very simple one. It's a very calculatable, if that was a word, um, type of signal to follow. Yeah, and so number one is is account selection and prioritization. Number two is developing storyboarded sales plays that matter. Here's what I mean. Most of your listeners have heard of sales engagement platforms, and they were like, "Oh, I have SalesLoft, I have Outreach, I have Groove, I have Rev.io. Great." Here's the problem. If you look at the stories that are being told inside those tools, story number one, like touch point number one, it's a pretty good story. Like marketing probably helped build it. The AEs and the SDRs, BDRs came together. They built a great little touch one. Right. Touch right. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or the are like follow-up messages to the first one. It's like everyone put their brain uh it went all in on message one, and then they parked their brain in message two through nine. Yep. And the rest of the messages are like, did you read my first message? The second one's like, did you read my first message? <laughs> and then message nine is like the breakup email. The like, breakup. oh, I guess you didn't like my first one. No, 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 no. Everyone needs to back up and think of it like when you write a book or you're writing a script to a movie, you build storyboards. Mm -hmm. So you have these tiles and you have to tell unique stories. And inside every story are foundational pillar pieces. There needs to be a, why should you listen? What value do we create? What is the time for knowledge exchange? Meaning if I'm booking a meeting with you, I'm not selling a product. I'm trying to acquire time from you. 30 minutes next mm -hmm. Thursday. What you have to give me is time. So I have to give you knowledge, insights like competitive intelligence or market studies or mm -hmm. benchmarking studies, something that is worth more than your time next week. The, the opportunity cost of you missing it is like, I can't miss this, I wanna have it. And then the last piece of that pillar is the call to action, very definitive date and time. So that goes within the story of each of your storyboards. Your yeah, storyboards yeah. need to be unique, five plus each very different because you have no idea what story is going to resonate with the customer. You have right. no idea which medium of communication they're going to latch onto. Was it your email, your LinkedIn message, your tweet, your smoke signal? Like you have no idea. <laughs> and everybody's will claim like cold calling is the best or email is the best. Like, no, you have no, for every person yeah. that they consume content differently. Right. Wow. But that's that that is a great perspective. Uh, and, and frankly, a perspective shift that one that I don't think a lot of sellers are thinking about. And, uh, wow, that, that is really, Most really interesting. What I call the drinking bird. There's an, uh, I'm old enough to have watched the Simpsons my whole life. And there's an episode <laughs> where Homer gains a ton of weight and he gets to work from home. This is like, they actually, during COVID, everybody laughed because like Homer fought to work from home, finally gets to work from home. He's wearing a muumuu. And he notices that his whole job is to hit the yes button all day long. So the <laughs> nuclear power plant doesn't burn down. Oh, he, he has a harebrained scheme. He notices a, a like one of those water drinking birds on his desk. And he puts the water drinking bird on the yes button just to keep hitting it. I find there's a lot of SDRs and BDRs that just take a cadence and they just hit send, 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 wow. send, send. And it's just like, not really that valuable. 
I uh, I never anticipated a, a Simpsons Homer analogy, but I love it. I've seen that episode, and yeah, you just you know you just keep hitting the same button over and over again until unfortunately the the water bird tips over and the nuclear power plant almost melts down. So don't let that happen to you, SDRs and, and the drinking ADs. bird. Don't be the drinking bird. <laughs> don't let it uh, backfire on you. Um, tell us, uh, you know, how do you come up with some of these things? Is this really just from working with clients and, and over the course of, uh, of your career, you've kind of started to formulate thoughts around this. Are you journaling this stuff? Are you, are you creating a newsletter? What, what's your creative process? I'm, I'm always interested to hear that, especially when I hear, you know, mindset shifting ideas like this. Uh, it, it always makes me curious. Yeah, so there's a, a, th- a thesis in the entrepreneurial community, community that the best products come from agencies, but the worst founders for introducing a product are professional services agency owners. Okay, so let's yeah. kind of back that up. When you own a professional services company, especially one that um, works with a high volume of customers, like there are some agencies that'll work on five projects a year and they don't really get to see like, like repeatable problems over and over again. I was fortunate enough where sales for life was at a price point at one point, the prices kind of rised and so did the size of the deals, but then the volume of the deals, but we were in that beautiful 20 to $50,000 a year snack bracket where we were working on like, 50 engagements a year. So you're in 50 of the biggest sales organizations in the world. And the first thing that you learn when you do this for long enough is you're all the same. There is no snowflake. And ironically, snowflake is a customer. There is no such thing as a snowflake. Every sales organization primarily is broken in about 80%. It's like Pareto's law. 80% all look the same. So you come to realize that there are first principles that fix a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then there's 20% that are 20% uniqueness. Um, that's where it comes from. Then as a creative process, um, we're just launching, you know, I, I used to blog every day. I make videos on YouTube all the time. Uh, we started a newsletter. It hasn't been distributed, but it's on our website. We just launched a podcast. Um, so yeah, I have a lot in my head that I'm trying to yeah. document. I, I wish that distribution could catch up to all the ideas in my head, but it hasn't got there yet. <laughs> that is the, you know, the hard part is like that you can have like a million ideas, but finally getting the time, the bandwidth, the chance to sit down and just execute is always the hardest. So but it's amazing what 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 you've done so far. So uh, for my listeners who are tuning in who want to get in touch with you, what's the best way uh, for them to do so? Go to pipelinesignals.com. Uh, you know, contact us. We'll have a call. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Jamie Shanks, and happy to, you know, I serve the sales community here to help account executives, especially account executives that know you need to self-source. Uh, whether you're an AE or an account manager, we help your sales organization scale pipeline creation. Awesome. If uh, Is there any kind of last final words of advice, words of wisdom that you'd leave for the sellers out there in 2023 who are grinding it out, especially in this ec- economic climate? Uh, any you know one thing you'd leave behind? Um, if you haven't figured it out already, you are an intrapreneur, which means a business within a business. And the most successful AEs I've ever met are understand that they control their own destiny, that nobody's going to come save them. Uh, and like a business owner, they have to just do most of it themselves. And they treat it like a what's a vocation, which means like this is their career and they're going to build a business within a business. The rest of the AEs that treat it like a job they struggle making quota. They end up leaving. They bounce. Mm-hmm. And I, I've never understood it when they bounce from vertical to vertical to vertical. Like two years ago, they sold to the CISO. And then next year, they'll sell to the UX designer. And then the year after, they'll sell to marketers. And so their social network never like builds momentum. Right. right. Um, so, you know, if you can try to sell to the same buyer persona all the time, and then you're just leveraging that re- those relationships. That is fantastic advice. 
Jamie, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was an absolute pleasure. I learned a ton and uh, can't wait to put this one on air. Thanks a lot. <laughs>